Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to be up here. Uh, so, I'm Rob. Uh, I'm doing a PhD in conspiracy theories, essentially. Uh, a little bit more specifically in the psychology of why we believe conspiracy theories. And I say we because I think we all have a little conspiracy theorist uh, inside us because of how our minds work. But we'll get onto that later. Uh, first, I, I want to answer one question which I know you're going to have because everybody asks me and uh, I don't want you wondering about it and being distracted instead of listening. So the answer is Northern Ireland. I'm from... <laughs> my accent's kind of all over the place sometimes, I know. But uh, I am Northern Irish, so now you know. All right, so let's talk about conspiracy theories. There's, there's a conspiracy theory for everything. The very first time I did a kind of public talk about conspiracy theories was at a little kind of one-day conference that we had in London a couple of years ago, and the lineup was supposed to be uh, academics and psychologists like myself, but at the last minute, one of our speakers had to pull out, and it ended up that he was replaced with a professional conspiracy theorist, a guy called Ian R. Crane, and this is what his website looks like. That's him up there. He calls himself a researcher, speaker, and geopolitical analyst. And he goes around the country talking about how everything's a conspiracy, uh, basically, and makes money doing that. So it was interesting. About half the audience were, uh, had come to see scientists talking about why we believe conspiracy theories, and the other half had come to see Ian R. Crane talk about conspiracies, and so they weren't fans of academics like myself. So it was a tough audience. I was kind of thrown in at the deep end, I felt. But the most interesting part of the day, I thought, or at least the most revealing part of the day, was in the Q&A after Ian's talk, Somebody from the audience asked him whether he had ever come across a conspiracy theory that he didn't think was true. And he was stumped. He, he didn't answer. Because it seems like for Ian and for people like him, conspiracy theories aren't just potential explanations uh, to be confirmed or uh, dis discarded based on the evidence. Instead, they are an all-encompassing worldview and so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, is the conspiracy worldview. The, uh, my favorite part of that day, though, was in the pub afterwards. I was talking to one of the conspiracy theorist audience members, and I, I asked him, you know, if Ian R. Crane is right about 9-11, if 9-11 was a conspiracy, why is Ian R. Crane allowed to go around the country telling everyone that it was a conspiracy? And the guy I was talking to, told me that he thinks Ian R. Crane is working for the government trying to discredit conspiracy theorists by deliberately making them look foolish. <laughs> you can't really argue with that, can you? But there is a conspiracy theory for everything, so I'm sure you've heard uh, the conspiracy theories about JFK. Uh, just about everybody's been accused of shooting him at some point. More recently, there are conspiracy theories about the 9-11 attacks and the death of Princess Diana. There are conspiracy theories that the US government faked the moon landing and that they're covering up the existence of aliens. Uh, I could go on. The Freemasons are up to no good, the New World Order is taking over, and the Queen is an alien reptile. I could go on, but I won't. The, the important point is that there is every event, everything you can possibly think of, there is a conspiracy theory for that. So, this is what I'm going to talk about. For about 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about why conspiracy theories matter, why we should care about them, and what is a conspiracy theory anyway? How do we define that? And then in the second half, for about 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about the psychology of why we believe conspiracy theories. So why do they matter? Why should we care? Well, part of the answer, I think, is their prevalence. We can't really avoid conspiracy theories these days. If you spend two minutes on the internet, you will probably come across some kind of conspiracy theory. Uh, some of them are fairly obscure, to be fair, but some of them have, relatively speaking, crossed over into the mainstream. So things like Loose Change, which uh, is a documentary about conspiracy theories of 9-11, 
The first version of it uh, was made by two guys, I think, in their bedroom on a laptop. But it's been through about three or four different versions since then, and the most recent version was uh, narrated by some proper famous guy off the telly, and it was released in a few cinemas in the US as well, and made a bit of money. But uh, even if you don't go looking for conspiracy theories, you're still gonna come across them in mainstream fiction. So in films like Oliver Stone's JFK, which uh, in my professional opinion is awful, don't waste your time on it, or the Bourne trilogy, I say trilogy because I don't count the most recent one, uh, in my professional opinion, Born Ultimatum, best film ever made. And of course, The X-Files, which we all know and love. And people aren't just entertained by these ideas. Substantial, perhaps surprising numbers of people uh, admit to believing in one or usually more conspiracy theories. So JFK is uh, by far the most widely believed conspiracy theory, up to uh, over two-thirds of people admit that they believe uh, some kind of conspiracy theory about JFK's assassination. Uh, about a third of people uh, in the UK and the US think that 9-11 was an inside job, that the US government did it. 41% of people think that the American Air Force is hiding evidence of aliens. And about a quarter of people think that the moon landings were fake, that Princess Diana's death was not an accident, and that climate change is a scientific fraud. So the prevalence alone of conspiracy theories, I think, makes them a, phenom a phenomenon of interest to psychologists. But what makes understanding conspiracy theories particularly important is the consequences that they can have. I think amongst skeptics and amongst academics, conspiracy theories are often regarded as maybe a little bit foolish, maybe a little bit funny, but ultimately harmless, right? Ultimately benign. But in fact, some conspiracy theories can influence people's behavior in negative ways. So I think a good example of that is anti-vaccinationism. You might have heard the claim that the MMR vaccine causes autism. Uh, it arose in Britain in 1998 when a doctor called Andrew Wakefield published a paper which claimed that the vaccine could cause autism. And in the early 2000s, it was the most heavily covered science story in the British media. This is despite the fact that Wakefield's research was uh, fundamentally flawed and there was a mass of epidemiological evidence against the claim. And it's not the only anti-vaccinationist claim that's been made. Throughout the years, all these claims have been made. So uh, the pertussis vaccine has been said to cause epilepsy and brain damage. Uh, the pneumococcus vaccine has been said to cause diabetes. Hep B has been said to cause sudden infant death syndrome. And the HPV vaccine has been said to cause strokes and paralysis. And going way back to the 18th century, the smallpox, the very first vaccine invented by Edward Jenner, the smallpox vaccine, was said to turn you into a car. Literally. Not metaphorically, literally. <laughs> now, this might seem quaint and funny to us, but biologically speaking, it's exactly as plausible as the idea that the MMR vaccine causes autism, which is to say, not plausible whatsoever. There's no evidence that it happens. In fact, in each one of these cases, scientific research has uh, gone against the claims, showing that the vaccines do not cause these effects. And yet, the claims have persisted. People believe them, and parents choose not to vaccinate their kids based on these claims. And we can quantify that. We can quantify how many children have gotten sick and died because of these claims. And conspiracy theories help claims like this to persist. These are supporters of Andrew Wakefield. He was, uh, his medical license was withdrawn in the UK based on malpractice and unethical conduct relating to his research. And yet here are some supporters of his holding up signs that say things like smoke screen and scapegoat and cover up clearly demonstrating the kind of conspiracist thinking that can help debunked claims persist after their sell-by date. And it's not just uh, conspiracy theories about vaccines. There are people who believe that the uh, HIV, HIV virus doesn't cause AIDS and that influences, influences their behavior. They don't use preventative measures and they don't seek treatment. There are politicians who think that climate change is a fraud 
particularly in the US, and they base their policies on that. And conspiracy theories are even involved in terrorism and radicalization and violence. Uh, just the other day, in fact, it emerged that the, the Adam Lanza, the new town shooter from a few months ago, was influenced. He was motivated by the Norway uh, massacre a couple of years ago. And Anders Breivik, who perpetrated the Norway massacre, was influenced by conspiracy theories that Europe was being taken over by Muslims. So conspiracy theories, the important thing to note is that conspiracy theories can have consequences for us all, not just for the people who believe them. All right. So now we all know why we should care about conspiracy theories. I think it's important to examine what exactly is a conspiracy theory. You'll notice that I've referred to a few different conspiracy theories already. And so things like JFK, Princess Diana, climate change. And I, I'm assuming that you all kind of agree that they are conspiracy theories, though we should label them conspiracy theories. And I think that's based on, we have a kind of intuitive understanding of what is and what isn't a conspiracy theory. We have a kind of intuitive definition. But I think it's worthwhile examining that and examining whether we all really agree. So I have uh, two statements here. And I want to know, by show of hands, whether you think that they deserve the label conspiracy theory or not. OK? So the first statement is, members of the US government secretly planned and executed the attacks of September 11th, 2001. Do you think it's a conspiracy theory? Almost everyone, okay. Does anybody think it's not a conspiracy theory? Nobody at all? All right, well, here's the second statement. Members of Al-Qaeda secretly planned and executed the attacks of September 11th, 2001. Does anybody think that's a conspiracy theory? Okay, that's interesting. So, uh, does anybody think that it is not a conspiracy theory? So, a lot of people kind of on the fence. Okay. Okay, well, that's good. That reveals that we're not all, when we subject our intuitive definition to scrutiny, perhaps we're not uh, as sure about what is and what isn't a conspiracy theory as we thought. So, what, uh, well, I would agree with most people here who say that the first statement is a conspiracy theory and the second one isn't. But the question is why? What is the difference between these two statements? The, uh, obviously, it's not something on the surface. It's not some simple property because the statements are identical in everything except the entity who's cast as the conspirators. So where's the difference? I think clearly it's something deeper, it's something below the surface in the context and the assumptions of the claims. So here's what I don't think a conspiracy theory is. There are quite a few dictionaries and a few philosophers who adopt this kind of all-inclusive definition, essentially along the lines of a conspiracy theory is any theory that postulates a conspiracy. And I think that this is clearly an unsatisfactory definition. I think it's worse than useless. The problem with it is it's vastly over-inclusive. It would include both the statements I showed a second ago. And it fails to capture the common meaning of the term as we generally use it. And one of the problems with it is that conspiracies are real. Conspiracies occur every day, and they've occurred throughout history. Certain types of conspiracy, usually kind of mundane conspiracies like you know drug smuggling, and price fixing and things like that. And we're not interested in those kind of conspiracies. As a psychologist and as skeptics, that's not what we mean when we say conspiracy theory. So I think this definition is, uh, is a better starting point. This is a definition offered by David Aronovich in his book Voodoo Histories, in which he says, a conspiracy theory is the unnecessary assumption of conspiracy when other explanations are more probable. And I like this definition because I think it highlights the fact that there is a qualitative difference between claims which we regard as conspiracy theories and claims which we don't regard as conspiracy theories. And so it allows us to say that certain claims are, like the claim that the US government perpetrated 9-11, that is a conspiracy theory, and the claim that Al-Qaeda did it is not, because they differ in plausibility. 
Uh, I like it as well because it doesn't say anything about the objective truth of the claims. Because Im implausible claims can turn out to be true. But I think we can go one step farther than that kind of definition. I think we can begin to examine the characteristics of conspiracy theories and to pick out those characteristics that really identify and define conspiracy theory. So I think firstly, a conspiracy theory is an unsubstantiated claim, which isn't to say that it's necessarily untrue, just that given the current state of the evidence, we can't say with any kind of certainty that it is true. And note as well that this means conspiracy theory as a category is permeable, it's not fixed. So a claim which we might regard as a conspiracy theory one day can change. It can become not a conspiracy theory given new evidence. If we had compelling evidence of its truth, we would no longer regard it as conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theories don't exist in isolation. They necessarily compete with an alternative, more plausible and more evidence-based explanation. And this is usually labeled by the conspiracy theories as the official story. And conspiracy theories invariably assume endemic deception and misinformation. So the official story, what's called the official story, is never just a mistaken hypothesis. Instead, it's a deliberate fraud concocted by the conspirators. Conspiracy theories invariably pertain to events of profound, obvious importance. So usually things like uh, assassinations of important people or terrorist attacks or natural disasters and things like that. They never pertain to the kind of mundane conspiracies that we know occur, like drug smuggling and like price fiction, fixing and so on. Conspiracy theories assume unusually malign intent and hyper-competence on the part of the conspirators. And by that I mean that conspiracy, the conspirators are invariably said to be tyrannically evil and bent on world domination. And they're said to be so powerful that they're able to control, to plan and control events and to keep their actions secret in a way that we know just isn't really feasible in the real world. Conspiracies that people have tried to pull off have failed because they become discovered, like Watergate. Conspiracy theories are invariably lacking in positive evidence. They're based instead on picking anomalies and finding holes and hidden connections. And they're not based on putting forward strong positive evidence. So for example, nobody's ever put forward compelling evidence of explosives being found in the Twin Towers and being used to bring them down in a controlled demolition. And finally, conspiracy theories are self insulating against change or correction. They're ultimately unfalsifiable because any evidence, even evidence which seems to directly contradict the conspiracy theory, can be incorporated into the theory and seen as deliberate misinformation put out there by the conspirators to mislead us. So there is no way to prove conspiracy theories wrong. Now, obviously, these aren't objective black and white criteria, these are just what I reckon define conspiracy theories. And so it's not the only way to define them, it's maybe not the best way. I haven't heard a better way, to be honest. If you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them. But I think putting forward a more precise and accurate and succinct definition simply isn't possible, given the diversity of conspiracy theories as a category of explanation. I think this kind of family resemblance approach is the most useful and productive approach towards characterizing conspiracy theories. All right, so now that we all know what a conspiracy theory is and why we should care about it, the question is why do some people believe conspiracy theories? It doesn't seem to be simply a case of rational evaluation of the evidence because they're usually contradicted by the vast consensus of scientific evidence and they diverge from reality in certain fundamental ways. So it seems like there are certain psychological factors which might predispose people towards believing in conspiracy theories, and that's the question that I'm trying to answer with my PhD. Now, the first thing to say is that there's been very little research. Over the last kind of 40 years or so, there's only been a handful of psychological studies conducted into why people believe conspiracy theories. 
So the, the findings that I'm going to talk about are necessarily preliminary and uh, subject to replication. Some of the effects are quite small. And so the important thing to say is perhaps uh, the kind of personality and cognitive factors that I'm going to talk about don't necessarily characterize every single conspiracy theorist. There are going to be people who don't fit these categories. That's just the nature of psychological research. But uh, the good thing about having such little research is that I can hopefully run you through everything that's been done in the next kind of 10 or 15 minutes. There are four main avenues of research that have been explored, and I'll run you through each one in turn. So the first kind of avenue of research concerns the structure of conspiracy theories, and by that I mean how different conspiracy beliefs relate to one another. So if you think about it, there's no real reason that someone who believes that the moon landing was a hoax should also believe that the 7-7 bombings in London in 2005 were also a conspiracy, but they probably do. This is one of the most robust findings to emerge from the limited psychological research, is that people who believe one conspiracy theory tend also to believe many others, even uh, completely unrelated conspiracy theories logically or empirically. So you can end up with a nice network of beliefs. This is a fairly simple diagram, but uh, you can see how all these beliefs kind of hinge together. You got uh, George Bush up at the top there, looking like Hitler, obviously, and he's somehow connected to just about everything. You know, you got, uh, you got Vietnam over here somewhere, you got 9-11 down here, you got uh, Second World War somewhere. Just about everything can be incorporated into a vast conspiracy theory together. And the nice thing about this from a psych... What's that? Yeah, everything. Everything's in there somewhere. This, this diagram goes on farther. I've trimmed it down to fit on the screen here. There, there's more. The nice thing about this from a psychological point of view is that it means that people don't just pick and choose the conspiracies they believe in. They tend to believe uh, everything or nothing to some extent. So we can measure this, we can treat it as a psychological, as a personality trait, and we can measure it, and we can see what this personality trait of conspiracism or conspiracist ideation tends to, co tends to correlate with. And so one kind of category of variables that have been looked at are what we call demographics, and these refer to people's kind of circumstances, things like age and gender and occupation and income and education. And slightly surprisingly, none of these kind of variables seem to correlate reliably with belief in conspiracy theories. So this kind of goes against some common stereotypes of conspiracy theorists as being sort of poor and uneducated middle-aged males and their cats. Conspiracy theories tend to be equally prevalent amongst all kind of strata of society. Everybody is susceptible to believing conspiracy theories. One, one slight e exception to this is uh, research within the US tends to find that ethnicity, being a member of an ethnic minority, tends to correlate with believing in conspiracy theories. And so this is a potentially interesting finding. It may be that certain conspiracy theories are simply more relevant to minority groups. So uh, in the US, African Americans tend to endorse conspiracy theories about the assassination of Martin Luther King more strongly than do Caucasians. But uh, th we tend to find this finding for all conspiracy theories, regardless of relevance to race or ethnicity. So it may be a case of um, ethnic minorities facing more discrimination on a daily basis and having generally a little bit more reason to distrust the government and other authorities. We don't really know. And it may be just a case of, uh, it's a product of the unique racial history of the US because none of this research has been replicated outside of the US. We don't know how generalizable it is, but uh, it may be interesting. So a different uh, avenue of research concerns not people's kind of circumstances, but their psychological makeup, uh, in particular their personality traits. So we're interested in what kind of people tend to believe conspiracy theories. Why do some people believe and not others? Why is it the Mulder believes in conspiracy theories but not Scully. What is it about that guy? So there are 
three kind of clusters of personality traits that we tend to find correlations with. And I've illustrated each one with a relevant image from the X-Files, which I thought was quite clever. <laughs> so the first one, the first cluster of personality traits that we find correlations with hinges around paranoia. So we tend to find correlations with things like lack of trust of everybody, of your friends and your neighbors, of the police and the government. We tend to find correlations with uh, pessimism about the future, with cynicism, with defiance of authority of any kind. And it seems like what all these personality traits have in common is mild paranoia. People who are kindly, kind of mildly paranoid tend to believe more in conspiracy theories. And I think it's important to point out that this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Being a little bit paranoid and suspicious of others could be beneficial to your well-being. If somebody is scheming against you, if there is a conspiracy out to get you, then being a little bit paranoid could help you discover it and save you from harm. I think the, the problem is when people become a little bit too paranoid and perhaps they start perceiving conspiracies which aren't there. So the second kind of cluster of personality traits revolves around openness, what psychologists refer to as openness to new and unusual information. So we find correlations with, uh, with belief in the paranormal and superstitions and new age ideas and with what we call the big five trait of openness, which is basically being open, receptive to any kind of unusual information. And so it seems like uh, people who are generally open are more likely to seek out information relating to conspiracy theories and ultimately more likely to be receptive to that information. And again, I think it's worth pointing out, not necessarily a bad thing, right? It's good to be a little bit open-minded and perhaps you can discover things that really are out there and important to know. But again, it's a matter of finding the right balance, right? I think uh, you wanna be open but not so open-minded that your brain falls out, right? As the saying goes. And so the third kind of cluster of personality traits revolves around powerlessness. So we find that people who report feeling low in self-efficacy, who feel like they don't have control over their own circumstances, we find that people who uh, are low in self-esteem and are generally dissatisfied with life tend to endorse conspiracy theories more strongly than do other people. And this can be a stable personality trait, but it can also be a sort of uh, temporal, uh, short-lasting uh, feeling. So researchers have temporarily induced lack of control in people by asking them to remember a time when they lacked control over their own circumstances, and they found that in that moment, people were more likely to endorse conspiracy theories. So this seems like, for these people, for most people, that is an aversive, unpleasant psychological state to be in, and so conspiracy theories may offer a kind of explanatory tool. So if the truth is out there, then maybe it helps to explain what I'm kind of going through in here. So just to recap uh, those, the personality traits, we find correlations with paranoia, lack of self-efficacy, and openness. But it's worth reiterating that these are based on quite a few findings and it's all kind of preliminary and some of the, some of the relationships are quite small. And the other important thing to point out is that we don't know the direction of causality. So we don't know whether people who are paranoid are more drawn towards conspiracy theories or whether people who come to believe conspiracy theories may become more paranoid. Because if you think the government's out to get you, that might make you a little bit paranoid, right? I think the most likely thing is that the relationship is kind of reciprocal. It goes both ways. And so more paranoid people are more disposed to conspiracy theories and they become more paranoid and maybe more disposed to conspiracy theories. And the same might go for openness and for powerlessness as well. But uh, all quite preliminary, don't really know. So I've talked about the demographic factors and the personality factors, and they kind of seek to answer this question of who believes conspiracy theories, what kind of people but they don't really answer the question of why do people believe. I think to begin to answer this question of why do some people believe, we need to look at cognitive biases. 
So as you might be aware, there's a large body of research that's emerged over the last kind of 30 or 40 years to show that we have two sort of cognitive systems. And Daniel Kahneman, one of the guys who kind of pioneered, pioneered this research, published a book recently called Thinking Fast and Slow. So this is what this lovely illustration kind of uh, illustrates. The slow system represented by the tortoise here is what we like to think of as reason. So these cognitive processes are slow and they're based on rules and logic and evidence and they are available to conscious awareness. So when we're using reason, we're kind of aware of it. We know what we're doing. In contrast, the fast system represented by the hare here is what we think of as intuition. These processes are fast and they're automatic and they're approximate. They're based on heuristics and biases, mental shortcuts and emotions. And importantly, they're not available to conscious awareness. When we've been influenced by these kind of processes, we don't know about it. We have no idea. So we generally like to think that we rely on reason most of the time, right? We evaluate evidence and we come to judgments. We come to our beliefs based on reason and evaluation of the evidence. And we're generally sensible. But this isn't the case. Research over the last 30 or 40 years increasingly reveals that in all kinds of situations, no matter what it is, we're influenced by our intuition. We come to our beliefs, we arrive at our behaviors because of our intuition, and we don't know about it because it's not available to conscious awareness. And I think that some of these biases may be why some people believe conspiracy theories. I think there are certain biases that can make conspiracy theories seem more plausible than they otherwise would. So there are four of these biases that have actually been researched so far, just based on a handful of studies again. And I think they begin to get at the question of why some people believe. And I'll run you through each of the four biases quickly. So the first one is what we call the proportionality bias. This refers to the assumption that we have that big, momentous, important events must have had big, momentous, important causes. And so you can see this maybe in your everyday life. Like when you met your fiance, you might like to think of that as being a result of fate, as opposed to just getting drunk and throwing up on her shoes. And, or is that just me? And um, I think this applies to conspiracy theories as well. So think about the assassination of JFK, who was at the time probably the most important man on the planet. We don't like to think that some lone, unknown, and possibly, un, uh, possibly unbalanced individual could have gotten out of bed one day and essentially changed the course of history just on a whim. That doesn't fit with this proportionality bias. And so a kind of vast, insidious, long-lasting conspiracy involving hundreds of people can begin to seem more plausible. And I think this fits with, uh, with conspiracy theories in the real world. So the assassination of JFK has become the most widely believed conspiracy theory, and yet the failed assassination of Ronald Reagan has inspired almost no widely known conspiracy theories. And this has been researched in a couple of studies. Researchers basically made up a news story, a fictional news story, about a president of an unidentified country who had been shot at by an assassin. There were two different versions of the story. In one, the assassin's bullet hit the president and he was killed. In the other version, the bullet missed and he survived. And participants were much more likely to attribute the uh, assassin to a conspiracy when the bullet hit and the president was killed, which is in line with this proportionality bias. The second bias is what Michael Shermer likes to call the patternicity bias. And this refers to our tendency to seek and find meaning in ambiguous stimuli. So, all right, can anybody see anything in this kind of image on the left here? Any? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Please have him removed immediately. <laughs> He's dangerous. Well, interesting. Very, very interesting. What about this one on the right here? Saturn. Saturn, yes, indeed. Well, actually, Well, you're, most of you are quite right. There's nothing at all in here. And in here, there's a kind of noisy picture of Saturn. Incidentally, David Icke reckons that the rings of Saturn are fake. 
They're broadcasting mind control rays to the moon, which is fake as well, obviously. The moon amplifies them and beams them down to Earth, where they control our minds. You can't prove them wrong, that's all I'll say. So anyway, <laughs> researchers have showed people these kind of images and manipulated the control they feel over their own circumstances as well. And they find that when people lack a sense of control over their own circumstances, they're more likely to see images where none exist, like in this noisy stimuli here. And importantly as well, they're more likely to see conspiracy as the explanation for ambiguous events. And so it seems like in exactly the same way as we can find meaning in noisy visual stimuli here, we're able to find meaning in the kind of noise of everyday events and world events. Uh, the third bias is called the projection bias. And this refers to our tendency to assume that other people think and feel and behave in much the same way as we would ourselves. So just out of interest, by a show of hands, who, if you were in the situation of the US government back in the 1960s, who would have faked the moon landing? So a few people, the rest of you, are liars. I, I did fake the moon landing. It was me. Sorry. It's nice to get that off my chest. Anyway, the one study has looked at the projection bias. They basically asked people this question. If you had been in the situation of the US government, would you have faked the moon landing? Uh, if you'd been in the situation of the British monarchy, would you have killed Diana? Would you have pulled off 9-11? And so on. And what they found was that people who said, yes, I would conspire, probably, were more likely to believe that conspiracy theories were true. <laughs> so it seems like the theory behind this is that people who generally feel like they would conspire project this tendency outwards onto others, and they feel like everybody else would probably conspire as well. And if everybody else would conspire, then it's more likely that historically some of them have gone through with it. And lastly then, we have the good old confirmation bias. And this refers to the tendency of once we form a belief or an opinion, we rarely subject it to a critical evaluation. We're unlikely to change it. Instead, we tend to seek out information that's consistent with that and to interpret information in a way that makes it fit in with our prior beliefs. And so one study, again, has looked at this in the context of conspiracy theories. And what they did was they got two groups of people, one group who believed the conspiracy theories about JFK's assassination, and another group who disbelieved them, who were skeptical about the conspiracy theories. They showed both groups exactly the same information, which contained information both kind of consistent with the conspiracy theories and against it. And what they found was that after being exposed to exactly the same information, people who had started believing the conspiracy theories believed it more strongly. And likewise, people who started disbelieving the conspiracy theories disbelieved even more strongly. They remembered the evidence that was consistent with their prior belief uh, better, and they found it more compelling. And so I think the important thing to know about that is that it's not just the conspiracy theorists who are prone to these biases. It's all of us. We all form our beliefs thanks to intuition and thanks to biases. And that's what I mean when I say that we all have a little conspiracy theorist inside us. We all have this part of our brain trying to tell us that conspiracies are probable. So just to kind of recap and conclude then, what have we learned? We've learned that conspiracy theories are important because they're so widespread we can't really avoid them and because they can have consequences for our lives, not just for the lives of the people who believe them, but for all the rest of us as well. We've learned that conspiracy theory is kind of hard to define, but uh, I think they can be characterized in terms of these characteristics. They're unsubstantiated, they pertain to big events, they postulate deceptive, evil, hyper-competent conspirators, and they lack evidence and are ultimately unfalsifiable. We've learned that people don't seem to believe conspiracy theories, at least some of the time, based on evidence. At least some of the time, it seems that people's psychology, their personality factors, and their cognitive biases 
play a role in why they believe conspiracy theories. And so perhaps the truth isn't out there, perhaps it's in here. Thank you. Okay, so who has a question? Put your hand nice and high in the air. I will come to you, you will say your name, you'll say your question, Rob will answer it, and we'll all be pleased. Hello, I'm Dave. Blimey, that's louder than I thought it was going to be. I, uh, I know an individual who believes in a lot of various different uh, conspiracy theories, but he's also a murder detective. Is that a worrying combination? Uh, I've never had that question before. That's a good one. Um, you know... There hasn't been that much research into kind of behavioral correlates of conspiracy beliefs, as in what people who believe conspiracy theories are likely to do or how they're going to behave. Uh, there's definitely no evidence that they're going to be dangerous. Well, that's not true. There is. Well, not scientific, <laughs> not scientific evidence, but anecdotally, uh, you know, I mentioned Anders Breivik, who killed 69 people, I think, in Norway. He was influenced by conspiracy beliefs about, you know, the European Union being taken over by Muslims. And uh, Timothy McVeigh, who I had a picture of, he blew up the, uh, a building, a federal building in Oklahoma City. He was influenced by conspiracy theories about the government uh, up to no good. And there's one paper, it's not a scientific paper, but it's by a couple of guys from a think tank named Demos, based in London. And they looked at the use of conspiracy theories in... Uh, sort of extremist and radical groups like the IRA and Al-Qaeda and people like that. And they find that these kind of dangerous groups did tend to immerse themselves in conspiracy theories and the conspiracy theories helped to legitimize their actions uh, in some ways in kind of fencing themselves off from who they perceived as their enemies and in legitimizing violence against them. So... I don't know, maybe you should worry about your friend. I wouldn't go that far. Maybe uh, use uh, due diligence. I don't know the guy. <laughs> um, so. so your advice is use due diligence or jujitsu or anything you can to restrain this yes, guy. Yes, anything hurting. you can possibly do. Okay, I know we've got a question here. I think, have we got one there? You sort of, okay. Uh, oh, there's one here, and then I know there's one further towards the back, but I want to ask a couple on the way there so I don't get bored of walking. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Tom. One of the phrases that I've heard to describe uh, things like, especially 9-11 conspiracies, is this idea of a house of cards, that um, people, uh, people who believe the conspiracy will look at all the evidence of and they'll look for sort of like one thing. Um, one, one thing that's inconsistent with the official story and they will use that um, as one card but, but you pull that away and the whole of the house comes down. I mean, is, is that a recognized way of thinking or is there any sort of psychology behind, behind that? Uh, I think it's true that conspiracy theorists hunt for anomalies, they hunt for anything that doesn't seem to quite add up to them in the official story. But I don't think it's a case of they just latch on to one thing. I think invariably they find hundreds of things. They find anything they possibly can because when you're looking for something, you can find it. It's very easy to find it. And so things like loose change is, you know, two hours long. It throws out, I don't know how many claims. Uh, each one slightly different, but each one seemingly inconsistent with the official story. Um, there's a kind of alternative version of Loose Change called Screw Loose Change, uh, which is a website, I think it might be a documentary as well, a film, where they go through Loose Change and they examine each and every empirical claim that they make and find each one to be lacking, to be not consistent with the facts. And so I think that's more typical of conspiracy theories is that they're built, they are built out of a house of cards, but it's that weight of evidence that seems to give conspiracy theories their legitimacy. It's not that there's just one thing, not one hole that they pick in the story, it's they find it to be full of holes. Um, 
supposedly that there must be some conspiracy theories that started as conspiracy theories and actually then evidence has turned up that supports them as being true. Is that right? Is that, is that common? Um, well, I mean, that kind of comes down to how you define conspiracy theories. And so you can look at things like, you know, um, Watergate, which prior to the evidence coming out could have been seen as a conspiracy theory. Or you can look at something like, you know, the, um, the claim that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Uh, you know, it would be possible to make an argument that those kind of things are conspiracy theories or were conspiracy theories before evidence of them being true, you know, Watergate being real or the evidence of weapons of mass destruction being made up before that came out. But I kind of think that conspiracy theories, what we call conspiracy theories, are different in certain regards. And so they're, like I said, they're invariably based on a conspiracy of world domination and by these people that are kind of tyrannically evil, like you only really see in films. And things like Watergate were relatively more mundane and patty. So, you know, Nixon just wanted to get reelected for whatever, I don't know, the prestige and the money. He didn't really want to take over the entire world. And nor did the British government or the US government. They just wanted to invade to get money from oil. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, I built that into my kind of definition or my characterization of conspiracy theories. I think it, you have to look at the evidence. And if something's true, then obviously it's not a conspiracy theory. But I, I don't think it's necessarily a true conspiracy theory. I think it's just a true conspiracy. Okay, um, first, thank you very much for the talk. Very, very interesting. Um, mine's, it's kind of an observation. So I saw like, a similarity between skeptics and conspiracy theorists. Uh, I'm quite a reductionist. I see things like brain chemistry. Um, and the sort of validation that conspiracy theorists get from looking at things, finding the patterns, finding people who agree with them, is quite similar to what we get as skeptics when we look at like a new conspiracy theory or alternative medicine, find what's wrong with it. And it leaves the same sort of like dopamine release and validation of your beliefs uh, reward system in the brain. And just, as you see, it's quite similar, just different paths to the same goal. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. We're all just looking for an explanation for events, for reality. And some people are drawn to different kind of explanations than others. And I think the, the rewards of conspiracy theorizing are a really interesting thing, which hasn't been looked at at all, really. There's no research looking at that. But I think it's certainly possible that conspiracy theorists get uh, a sense of fulfillment out of, out of their beliefs and out of researching that and going on Google and finding stuff that is consistent with what they believe. And as a social movement as well, I think you know the kind of conspiracy groups that meet up and get together and share their beliefs and kind of reinforce each other. I think for those people, that's probably a good thing in their life. You know, that gives them fulfillment as well. Um, the last couple of years, I've happened to be in New York on the anniversary of 9-11. And still, every year, a bunch of conspiracy theorists get together uh, a couple of blocks across from Ground Zero and give out flyers and DVDs and stuff. And the thing that struck me, the first time I was there, it was on the 10th anniversary, and there was a whole street block that was cordoned off for these people. There were hundreds of conspiracy theorists. And, but everyone that I spoke to was from somewhere else. None of them were New Yorkers. None of them had lost someone in the attacks. None of them had any personal in investment. There were people who had traveled from Canada. There were people who had traveled from Australia just to be there, to be at Ground Zero, and to get together with all these people who they'd only spoken to online and to see them face to face and to give out leaflets and stuff like that. And so I think for people like that, it's clearly a kind of social thing. You know, they get something out of that. They get something out of sharing their beliefs with other like-minded truth seekers. And it's something that there needs to be more research into, into what people get out of these kind of beliefs. Hiya. Um Bearing in mind 
people who believe in conspiracy theories kind of disregard the facts. If you're in a room with someone who believes in something, how do you talk them out of it? <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent question. I'm often in rooms with people who don't agree, and I've never convinced anyone. Um, but again, there's been no research at all into strategies to uh, engage with conspiracy theorists and try and change the mind or educate people to you know, be appropriately skeptical. No research at all. So we don't really know how to do that. We don't know what we can do. Um, I certainly, in my personal experience, I have no idea. Um, because you know, people become so invested in their beliefs that it becomes a, a core part of who they are. And, you know, not just conspiracy theorists, all of us, this is true of. So, I don't know, there's a colleague of mine at Goldsmiths is doing research into uh, belief change based on how the beliefs were formed. So you can form beliefs for kind of rational, uh, evidence-based reasons, or you can form them for kind of emotional reasons. And the, your strategy for kind of tackling beliefs like that has to depend on how the belief was formed. If it was formed uh, emotionally, then maybe an emotional kind of appeal is going to be more successful. Whereas if it was formed on the basis of evidence, then maybe an evidence-based appeal. But like I say, the research is very early days, and we don't really know. And uh, it's a good question. I wish I knew. Um, I've, I've actually got a question. Uh, a little while ago, I was interviewing somebody who um, firmly believed that Princess Diana was killed. It was a big conspiracy. And one of the things that they brought up as evidence was that of the, the route that Diana took, there were 27 CCTV cameras, and not a single one of them was pointing at the road when she drove past, which sounds very convincing until you look into those cameras, and they all turned out to be private CCTV cameras owned by shops pointing at the doorway to make sure no one vandalized them. And it was obviously very clearly a, uh, a, a, a rhetorical sleight of hand to try and convince you in the argument, but very clearly not something that uh, the person even said it knew was uh, a convincing argument. So how often do you see these, um, these pseudo-facts brought up by someone who you fully believe doesn't actually think it's convincing? And how do people reconcile bringing up something unconvincing and that they know to be false just to try and further an argument because their, their own facts don't seem to be working? Yeah, I think that's a really common strategy. And so one of the things I always think of is 9-11 conspiracy theorists who think it was a controlled demolition. One thing that they point to often is if you watch video of the, of the towers collapsing, which I wouldn't recommend, but I've done a lot, and it's depressing. But if you watch it, you see these kind of puffs of smoke coming out of the odd window, kind of maybe 20 floors below where it's actually collapsing. And conspiracy theorists point to this and they say, look, these are squibs. They're evidence of controlled demolition. Controlled demolishers use squibs to kind of start the collapse of buildings, and it's proof. And in fact, what these puffs of smoke are, are just air being compressed by the collapsing building, being forced down elevator shafts and stuff like that, and finding the path of least resistance to escape, and blowing out windows and blowing out smoke and debris and stuff like that. And Controlled demolition experts have looked at this and they've said that doesn't look anything like a controlled demolition if, if it was it would be in a kind of consistent pattern It wouldn't be random windows all over the place and stuff like that, but I think for the conspiracy theorist They stop at the start there when they see these puffs of smoke and they think oh that looks a bit like an explosion Like you might demolish a building with that's where they stop and they don't put any more thought into it It's consistent with their idea that it's a conspiracy, that it was a controlled demolition, and so no further examination is required, I think. Hi, uh, Aid. Just uh, as an academic, I'm sure you're, you're interested in and encourage a rigorous debate, but uh, something that seems to me about, and you've done it tonight, about conspiracy theories is it seems to be a, a, ta a sort of cover-it-all tag to just stop R rational debate or stop further investigation and the lady in the front mentioned it earlier about uh, incidents and in previous historical incidents that have shown where conspiracy ha has occurred um, I mean things like uh, I mean the, the, a couple of older ones that people may not know about you can google it if you want or uh, wiki it or so is uh, the, the case of Alice Wielden this was a, a woman in Derby 
who was um, sent to prison for 10 years for conspiracy to murder David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister at the time, apparently with a poison, a poison dart. Now, the records were kept under, under wraps for over 80 years by the British government, and it was only in the late 90s that it came out that the, there was agent provocateurs who uh, were involved in the scheme, and basically it was a set-up by to, to stop and, and to stop political uh, opposition to the to the first world war. There's another one as well, uh, the Walsall Anarchists of 1892. Same thing, an agent provocateur from the security services was there and uh, basically got guys, I think about four or five guys, got ten years in jail. So I think I was just interested in your view that where, where things have happened. And it's been pro, I mean, people were saying there was conspiracies about Hillsborough, the police and the, and the media and whatever connived. And about 20 years ago, you were, you were being told that that's a conspiracy theory. These things have come out as fact now. The Jimmy Savile business now, or the, the, the whole nexus of, of what he's involved with now, you know, a lot of that, although it's still being investigated and it's still under known, but there's a lot of, you know, things that would have been dismissed by the cover all tie conspiracy theories which are worthy of further investigation. And you mentioned you know, some, some of the conspiracy guys, people who make a living out of this. Uh, and there is definitely disinformation and misinformation out there to muddy the waters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I wouldn't disagree whatsoever that conspiracies happen uh, in the real world, like I said. And I would certainly never discourage anyone from investigating them and trying to get the full facts out. And I certainly wouldn't want my kind of biased, subjective definition of conspiracy theory to be used to label and to dismiss certain claims. That's not what I'm trying to do whatsoever. As far as the definition goes, that's just um, from, from my perspective as a psychologist, I have to try and operationalize to define what I'm looking at. And that's just a convenient uh, sort of characterization, I think. But I'm not trying to dismear or to smear or to dismiss any claims at all. What I would say though is, is one of the things I find most interesting psychologically about the whole conspiracy theory thing and conspiracies being real is that real conspiracies have never been revealed by conspiracy theorists. They've been revealed by reporters and by whistleblowers, by civil servants, members of the government, people who the conspiracy theorists would consider to be part of the conspiracy. And yet they are the ones who reveal the real conspiracies and conspiracy theorists don't. I would say that my characterization of conspiracy theories is, um, I think, convenient. And the, the theories that I'm talking about, the kind of global domination theories and you know, hyper-competent conspirators and everything else I mentioned, I think those kind of theories are an intellectual cul-de-sac. They're not going to lead anywhere. They're not plausible. Whereas the kind of conspiracies we know do occur in the real world are certainly worth investigating. But I'm not going to tell anyone not to investigate anything else. I think... Uh, people should be interested in the truth and in evidence and uh, try and get to the bottom of things. Hey, um, when measuring um, certain personality traits and their relationship with belief in conspiracy theories, how accurate are these measures? Are they mostly you know, self-report measures or is it possible to get more objective measures for these beliefs? Yeah, um, it's a good point. All the measures that we've used so far have been just kind of paper and pencil self-report measures, you know, what do you reckon about yourself, what do you reckon about 9-11 and stuff like that. And it is flawed in, uh, in fundamental regards. It's kind of the best that we have at the moment and when, when findings tend to converge, we can be relatively more certain that they're kind of valid. And so the findings I mentioned are kind of the most robust findings that we have. They're not brilliant by any means but uh, they do seem to be consistent. Different studies have found the same kind of things. But um, I think it's a really good point. Research in the future, as, it, as more people start to look into this and uh, look at more specific things and try and get to the heart of it, it's gonna have to use different kind of research methodologies 
and try and avoid the kind of biases and self-reporting problems that we can come across and uh, yeah, try and overcome that. Hello, Rob. Um, I've studied this extensively myself and thought about it a lot. Um, issues of um, self-esteem, paranoia, loneliness. People have had bad experiences. So the social benefits of going to groups like skeptics uh, in April, is it? And so on. Um, and just on the subject of... Uh, the Princess Diana thing, um, I'm more likely to believe that that happened, uh, that she was uh, bumped off, um, than um, the 9-11 thing. Um, only because I believe that the Queen Mother said, uh, that's a relief, and uh, a Royal Protection Officer that I met once virtually told me, for what it was worth, that uh, that's what happened. Um, Anyway, at a previous uh, one of these sessions, we had a certain speaker who gave a presentation uh, about the cuts that the government are implementing and the deficit and all the rest of it, and uh, that this government uh, would have done what they're doing ideologically, um, even if we hadn't had this so-called uh, uh, deficit problem. And so it, that's a conspiracy theory. I don't know what your politics are, but do you believe that that might be? Uh, can you be more specific? I'm not sure I understand. What's, what's the conspiracy theory? Um, that, that this government is, uh, do, is executing all the cuts and affecting the, the poor people uh, the ordinary people, because ideologically that's what a conservative government does. And they're using uh, the financial situation as an excuse to do it. Um, previously it would have been a lot harder to get away with it. So that's a conspiracy theory. Uh, what do you think of, of it? Do you believe it? Uh, well... I don't know, I don't really follow politics, to be quite honest. Perhaps I should more. But I'm not sure that it meets my kind of characterization of conspiracy theory. I'm not sure it's the kind of, you know, global domination conspiracy. And I'm not sure that... Well, it's quite true that politicians are uh, uh, not the nicest people always. And they do things that uh, the rest of us might not enjoy might not be in our best interest but that doesn't make it a conspiracy theory necessarily that makes it kind of self-interested people seeking power uh, trying to increase their paychecks I think I'm not sure that it meets the definition of conspiracy theory at least not as far as I think of conspiracy theories okay and I've got a question here and then there's one at the bar uh, if anyone's got a burning question, put your hand up. I realize we've uh, had the, uh, the speaker speak for quite a while now, but there's a couple more we can get through. If you haven't asked one already, I'll try and keep it uh, to one question each just so we don't exhaust Rob too much and have him collapse on the stage. Hi, Rob. Thanks for the talk. Um, you used the word heuristic uh, in, your, in your talk, um, and I've now found out exactly what I think it means, but I've also heard that religious apologists argue from a heuristic point of view. Are religious apologists also conspiracy theorists in the same way? Uh, that's something I haven't thought about, uh, to be honest. I think as far as heuristic goes, it basically means uh, a sort of mental shortcut, a bias, a rule of thumb. So, and I think Everybody uses heuristics. Like I said, we're all, this is how our minds work. They're, they're designed by evolution, designed to, um, to work efficiently and effectively and to, to allow us to reproduce and to avoid danger. They're not designed to make us right about everything all the time. And so we rely on heuristics and biases all the time. Uh, religious apologists are no different to the rest of us, as far as I know. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, does it? 
Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. You were saying that there wasn't much research on uh, conspiracy theories, and I was curious, uh, th this question can go both ways. Is it that I am wrong in saying that conspiracy, theories gen conspiracy theorists generally tend to be more likely to need psychological help, or is it that that's the case and just people haven't actually done the research for whatever reason, and if not, why not? Uh, I certainly wouldn't say that conspiracy theorists need psychological help. As far as my research goes, what I'm doing for my PhD is I'm looking at the general population. I'm looking at everyone and how we all kind of hold conspiracist beliefs. If not explicit conspiracy theories like about 9-11, at least conspiracist sort of beliefs like people do bad things and want to control the world and stuff like that. So I think that we're all conspiracy theorists and I certainly wouldn't say that everybody who believes a conspiracy or a conspiracy theory is mentally ill. There is a little bit of research though showing that belief in conspiracy theories does correlate with things like schizotypal traits and delusional ideation in a non-clinical sense. So schizophrenia is characterized by delusions and, um, and hallucinations and so on requiring mental health treatment. But we all have hallucinations, we all have delusions sometimes, mild delusions and hallucinations. Uh, is there anyone here who hasn't hallucinated anything ever? So these things, these things are common in the general population, not just in people who require uh, mental health services. And I think conspiracy theories are the same um, as delusions and hallucinations. I think we're all kind of subject to them because of how our minds work. And uh, yeah, so I wouldn't say that conspiracy theorists need psychological help, necessarily. Okay, I know we've got a question at the bar. I mean, it's worth asking yourself, you know, that there hasn't been very much research done into conspiracy theorists, and you've got to ask yourself why. Who's stopping that research, and what are they <laughs> trying to achieve? Okay, uh, you'd be surprised to hear mine's not a very intellectual question. Uh, what's your favorite conspiracy theory, and why? <laughs> and that goes... To you, number one. <laughs> well, I mentioned David Icke and his ideas about Saturn and the moon and everything. I think that's going to be my favorite because it's, it encompasses everything. It's kind of a meta conspiracy theory because everything can be part of that. Our, our very perception is being manipulated by these rays, mind control rays being beamed on from the moon and from Saturn. And so whatever you think, it's because the moon is making you think that. There's no way you can argue with that. Excellent. Uh, do we have another question? I know we've had, you've already asked me, if we get time, we'll come back. But there's, some, there's one right in the corner here. I didn't see you because I've been terrible around the back of the room. Hello, my name's Steve. Um, how much of this is the entertainment factor? Because why let the truth get in the way of a good story? And I think, I, I think that people are conspiracy carriers. They actually don't believe it themselves. They just permutate the story, which goes on and on and on. So it's like a ripple effect. And the real people that pick it up and believe it, but uh, it's sort of interference, isn't it? These people that sit around, and I know a lot of those, they don't really believe it. They just go on. So how much do you think the entertainment factor? Because we all love a good soap, don't we? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think there must be a lot of people who just, who bullshit, essentially. There is a philosophical distinction between bullshit and lies. People who bullshit just take a position for the fun of it to see what happens, to see how other people react to it. And I think there probably is a lot of that within some conspiracy theorists. They just want to try on this kind of point of view to see how it fits and to see how everyone else likes it. And it's something, it's, it's an avenue of research that I think should be pursued, is how, the degree to which people's belief in conspiracy theories influences their behavior. And so some people just try it on and don't really base their behavior around it at all. Other people refuse to vaccinate their children. Other people make political policies about carbon emissions based on their belief that climate change is a hoax. And that's the really important stuff, I think, that's what we should focus on, at least in terms of, you know, interventions to try and change people's minds and make them look at the evidence a bit more. 
So I do think it's, it's a very important uh, avenue of research that hasn't been explored at all yet, but hopefully it will be uh, in the future. Hi, Rob. Um, I want to uh, put a question to the audience first. Is there anybody here from We Are Change Liverpool? No, no, no conspiracy theorists. Uh, second question, uh, what was the initial idea or thought that made you want to research conspiracy theories? Well, I think it was, it was a combination of just coincidence and a little bit of thought on my part, but I, just, I did just kind of fall into it. I noticed after the, the London bombings, 7-7 uh, in 2005, I noticed that immediately there were conspiracy theories about it. Like, I think the day after, I came across some kind of conspiracy theories about it. And I've noticed that since then, like, this doesn't reflect well on me. I think it probably says much about, as much about me as about conspiracy theories. But every time something big happens in the world, I Google that plus conspiracy <laughs> to see what kind of conspiracies are being made up about it. And invariably, there is something like, uh, when the Newtown shooting happened a few months ago, the very day, in fact, before any real information had been gathered, before the, the US media even knew the real name of the shooter, there were already conspiracy theories about that. And, you know, the same goes for the Russian meteor the other day and the resignation of the Pope and everything that happens, people are immediately coming up with conspiracy theories about it. So I noticed that and I thought that was interesting. But the main reason was just I was doing my undergrad project in psychology and there was a member of staff who was kind of interested in conspiracy theories and I thought that sounds fun and I did that and I stuck with it ever since. Um, well what I wanted to ask kind of ties into what you just said with the changing of technology and changing of communication is this something that we can sort of see as becoming more prolific or do you think we'll reach an e equilibrium with it? Is it, there's always going to be the certain type of people who, you know, are buy into that. And are we going to reach an equilibrium or are more people going to get drawn in? That's a good question. You know, conspiracy theorists have always been good at using the tools available to them to propagate their conspiracy beliefs as fast as possible. And so obviously with, with the internet, it's possible to spread a conspiracy theory within seconds, you know, of an event happening, of becoming aware of it. A little bit longer ago, you had to kind of write books and, or leaflets and periodicals and wait for people to read them and get back to you. And, but still, you know, anti-vaccination movements in the 18th and 19th century made great use of print media and distri distributed periodicals and posters and upsetting images and all that kind of stuff. And we're able to get their message out to as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And so I think that's a consistent theme of kind of conspiracy theories. And so with the internet, it's only gotten worse. And you know, if we have new technology to, to spread messages even quicker and more cheaply and to more people, then conspiracy theories are gonna spread even more quickly. Okay, I've, I've got two actually, just before I come to you. Um, the chap who mentioned Lady Diana over there with the uh, bald head who's conspiracy theorizing over there. Could somebody give him a nudge for me? I'm about to ask him a question. Hello, mate. Hello, I'm over here on the stage. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question about the question you asked before because you said you're more inclined to believe the Diana story than the 9-11 story. Does, 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 that mean, does that mean that you think there is plausibility in the 9-11 story as well? Not a remote possibility, plausibility. I'll take that one, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rob, there's something about um, having access to privileged information that's very, very attractive. In my corporate um, sort of life, you know, you step up the ladder a little bit more, you get to know a bit more that other people don't know and all that sort of thing. 
Is that a psychological phenomenon? Can you characterize it for me and how it fits in with what you've been discussing? Yeah, you know, again, I don't know if there's been research into it. There hasn't that I'm aware of. But I do think it's an important part of conspiracy theories is this possession of privileged knowledge. and I know something you don't. And one of the things I find most unpleasant about conspiracy theorizing is when people, when certain conspiracy theorists make predictions about the end of the world or about societal upset. And I find that particularly unpleasant because it seems like saying, I possess this knowledge, I know something's going to happen, and you don't, and so wait and see. And then if something does happen, it allows them to say, look, I told you so. And if it doesn't, it's forgotten. Like, I saw this YouTube video of Alex Jones, who's a massive conspiracy theorist in the US, and it was- In every was sense of the word massive. In every sense of the word massive. Indeed, yes. And it, it took, a number of predictions, I don't know if it was every prediction, but uh, dozens, maybe hundreds of predictions that he'd made over the years about you know, banking crises and societal collapse and uh, impeachment of presidents and stuff like that. And it just showed what he said and the date that he said it. And almost none of them came true. Some of them kind of vaguely came true, like the economic crisis. And of course, he took credit for that. But all the ones that didn't come true were forgotten. And so I find that particularly unpleasant is the pretense of privileged knowledge and the lack of repercussions for being wrong about that and the smugness if, uh, if you're kind of right about it. But uh, no real research again. Are Should you saying that 1776 won't commence again? <laughs> is that what you're saying? I'm not going to say that it won't. <laughs> okay. And then, as if by some amazing design, here I am back at the stage. So this is as good a time as any to end the Q&A. If you do have any more questions, I'm sure Rob is sticking around for a drink and things like that. But he probably needs a sit down and another pint and stuff. So please, a huge, huge round of applause once again for a fantastic talk tonight. Thanks. Absolutely brilliant.